Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the hosts and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have a problem with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West, transmitting across the internet, this is episode 126 of Registry Matters. How the hot in hell are you, Larry? Fantastic. You're looking really good on that cam. Uh-oh. You figured it out? It's pretty, it's pretty nice. Uh, I'm trying the, something new. The picture of me looks pretty, it's amazingly accurate. Yeah, it's a recent photo. I promise. It's a recent <laughs> photo. Uh, at the last conference, I think I got a picture of you, and that's, what is being, uh, that's what's being used for uh, representation of you. <laughs> well, it's, it's so close that I, I, I think it's, uh, you couldn't have done any better. Well, I mean, photos don't lie. I mean, it did, it did add maybe 10 or so pounds to you. That's a pretty, pretty typical complaint about photos is they uh, make you look about 10 pounds fatter. So, well, all right. Your hair's a little long, though. You must have uh, some COVID hair going on for this uh, photo that's being used. Yeah, I reckon I do. Uh oh, <laughs> you're I not using remember. any of those black market sur- uh, services, are you? I got to remember not to say those type of words because the uh, transcriptionist has trouble trying to figure out how to spell "reckon." Oh, yes, because he might spell W R E C K. What reckon? Like That's actually correct. breaking stuff. Uh, they, we, we've got to make it very simple for the transcriber. Now, tell me, why are we recording like seven hours early? Well, because it's the heat is uh, getting warmer and warmer in this office, and I'd like to be out of here before it hits 90. It's in the 80s now. Do you not know how to turn on the thermostat? I'm pretty sure I know how to turn it on. It, it's uh, inoperable at the moment. <laughs> Are we going to cover 700 articles from COVID-related things tonight? Hopefully not, but we, we've got a few. Okay. We're trying. I've got, I, I really do think that there's a certain amount of COVID fatigue with, you know, all you hear is about how many people have died. All you hear is about, it's just all the problems. And I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying as best as I can to avoid doing COVID articles. If we can. I mean, if they're relevant, they're relevant. But if they're not, like, can we drop them? Well, we've dropped about 10 already. Yes, we did. So are you, are you ready to begin with this first one that I think you would classify this one as funny? I think I would. All right. Well, this one, the first one comes from Tech Dirt. Ninth Circuit says man can't sue officers who destroyed his home to capture an unarmed homeless man. Larry, I got a question. Unarmed? The guy was actually like he didn't have his upper appendages? Well, he was, he was not. Uh, uh, he didn't have a weapon, but he indicated oh. that the to the police, he did have a weapon, and as, as the case unfolded, when he finally was taken into custody, he didn't have a weapon. But they responded as if he did have a weapon. They responded as if he was like Osama bin Laden and he was hiding in the bunker or something. I mean, they responded with uh, 55 vehicles, including a crisis response team motorhome and two helicopters. An unarmed homeless guy? Uh... That seems a little above uh, what would be necessary. I, what's the word that you use? Like, isn't there a word that we should use? The I mean, I guess appropriate response. This is an unarmed homeless guy. Like, we need fifty-five vehicles. But again, the unarmed was not discovered until after the apprehension. He he had told the the police that he was armed. Oh. So they're op- they're operating on that premise that that they were dealing with an armed person. Now I'm not justifying the response. I think. I think it was still probably excessive, but but the Fresno Sheriff's Department and the uh, Clovis PD uh, they were operating under the belief that he was armed at the time. And, and uh, but fifty five vehicles and two SWAT teams does seem a bit much. I I know I know that we're going to say that if we don't want them to use these things, then we shouldn't give them to them. I'm thinking of. You probably didn't see the movie called The Hurt Locker, but it was about a uh, bomb disposal guy over in Baghdad, Afghanistan, somewhere over in the Middle East. And the suit that he puts on to go dispose of a bomb, he the suit is designed for him to take a bomb blow directly to the face. And I'm thinking that we could have suited somebody up in a full suit of this, and he could walk in and go, hmm, I'm here to s- assess the situation. I could figure out that he doesn't have a weapon. And then we could asp- respond appropriately and just go in there with two guys or, you know, five people and not tear down the place. Maybe. Probably so. Um, 
I've always believed that that if you can contain a perimeter around a crisis situation, that time works in most instances in your favor, because if there's only one person, the police agencies will have a multiple. They can do shift rotations, and 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 time will eventually exhaust the person. Which, as they fatigue, they're either more willing to talk, surrender, or they're more, or it's more likely that you can catch them off guard and 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 do a. Uh, an arrest and and a disable incapacitate them. I think is the word I'm looking for, but you can incapacitate the suspect. But again, the question in this case was whether or not that that the police have immunity for their behavior, and did they violate some some? Uh, uh, they used the vehicle 1983 under, under uh, uh, 40, 42 United States Code section 1983 civil rights. They used that section. And they have a pretty high standard to show that there was some willful disregarding of of a person's constitutional rights. That precedent has to be clearly established, and they weren't able to meet that high hurdle because law enforcement has provided broad latitude in, in what uh, what deployment of force they use to bring a crisis under control. And they there was they they. They were found to be immune from the action by on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, which I know it's gotten more conservative since Trump has named so, several judges, but it's supposed to be one of the more liberal circuits still. And and they just they, they deferred to the police. Now, we don't know the three judges on the panel, which you know who appointed them. I didn't get that far into analyzing it, but he just didn't. You know the 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 damage was unfortunate, but the police are not responsible for the the of things that they damage when they're performing their official duties. And I don't think we've described that the damage done was that they, <laughs> they did $150,000 of damage. Five rooms were tear gassed, four doors and seven windows were destroyed along with 90 feet of fencing that was rolled over by SWAT vehicles. I don't think vehicles come 90 feet wide, even under the worst of circumstances or best of circumstances. Like your car is six feet wide, maybe. So how did they do 90 feet of damage to the fence? Couldn't they have they, made their way through it and then followed the car in front of them? They probably wanted the, uh, they wanted that sight barrier open, I'm guessing. This is all a conjecture here, but I'm guessing that they, uh, uh, law enforcement tends to be uh, uh, officer safety's first. And uh, th- those other factors are extraneous, but officer safety, clear sight lines, and, and making sure that they, that they have a containment perimeter now. Not knowing the layout of it, perhaps maybe that wall would have served as a better containment barrier than, than knocking right, it right, down. Right, right. But yeah, you would but, see the guy, and then he would have to, you know, unless it's like a two foot high fence, and he just steps over it. But you know, assuming that the guy would flee, and then he would have to uh, entertain the obstacle, like that would be a barrier for the person to go by. Well, I I pulled the uh, the the decision. It was very brief, and it's not precedential. Uh, it's it's not published. But then there was a there was a reference to a case out of the Tenth Circuit that was similar in, in in a city in Colorado, and they they did extensive damage to a home. Person had called the police, and they 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 were trying to apprehend a suspect. And they that the Tenth Circuit did a much deeper analysis, and that that complaint was on the takings clause of the U.S. Constitution, and the the uh, Tenth Circuit resoundingly said that that uh, that. The taking clause was not an issue because the takings clause has to do with compensation, due process and compensation for your property that's converted to public use. And, and they said that the police didn't convert the property to public use. They merely did what they needed to do to extract a felon. And therefore, the takings clause didn't apply. And I thought that it bears some relevance to the present circumstances with COVID-19 because I predict there will be, an, and I'm not alone in my predictions, there's been many people predict that there's going to be a plethora of litigation. But one of the things that's going to be the takings clause, businesses that have been shut down and shut down losing many, many thousands and hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions of dollars, depending on the size of the business, they're going to come in and allege that the government took from them. And this is going to be the comparison because if you do the same interpret, if you use the Tenth Circuit precedent, so if anybody were to bring this claim to me and ask me to screen it, 
I would say, well, the case law is not very favorable to you in the Tenth Circuit because even though you have had your life wrecked and your business des- destroyed, it's not like the government went into the, to, to your business and took it over and started operating it and, and exploiting the profits. They have just simply shut it down. So they have not, in the literal sense, and I know we believe in strict interpretation, that has not been converted to something for the public good. It's just simply you've not been allowed to use it. And, and, and we're going to have this, this deluge of litigation, and it's going to be very fascinating for legal junkies like, my, like me to, to see how this unfolds and what the courts say in terms of whether the government is liable for any of the damage that's been done. So that I can come back and say you were wrong later or right later? You, did, did you just semi-predict that it's not favorable for some business saying, you shut me down for X amount of months and I am going to sue the government for X told dollars? And you don't think that that would win because of precedent? Well, if they were going to use the takings clause as the basis okay. supporting their claim, and if they were in the Tenth Circuit, because I just read that decision before we started recording, so if they if their theory if they came to me with a theory and said, I believe the government has has violated the takings clause of the Constitution, I would say, really, have you looked at the Tenth Circuit case law of this? Well, no, I haven't. And I'd say, well, I have, and I'd say, what did the government take from you? And they would say, well, they they didn't let me operate my business. I would say, but the taking clause has been interpreted to be converting something to public good without compensation, without due process. You still own your property, so it hasn't been taken from you. It has not. It was not used for the public good. It would not. It would be. It would be different if they came in and said, "We're taking this facility from you. We need it for the public good. We're going to operate it for the next ninety days. We need. We need housing. Your hotel has just become a hospital ward." Yes. Then, then you would. I think you would have something under the takings clause. But if they just simply say your hotel can only operate at twenty five percent capacity, that's an order for the public good. Nothing. Nothing has been taken from you, and at least in the Tenth Circuit's interpretation of the takings clause. So I would tell you that I think your case is not going to be very strong if that's your sole theory for, for winning, that, that you probably won't get very far in this circuit. Hmm. Well, there you go. Larry has said it. Mark the date that we can either applaud you or condemn you. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's how, how about over at NPR? Voting rights for hundreds of thousands of felons at stake in Florida trial. This is related to the amendment, I believe, from uh, the 18 election where Florida voted against or to remove, to repeal the Fourth Amendment that prevented people with convictions from voting. Yet then, not long after that, the, the Republican-controlled legislature put in barriers say, to say you can't vote unless you've paid all money but it's a challenge for people to figure out how much they owe and to whom and how to pay it and all that stuff so they're just sort of like stuck in this murky uh rabbit hole well the the amendment four that passed uh, uh overwhelmingly i don't remember the margin but our super patron could probably tell us it restored the right upon completion of all obligations but the voters voted on language was all obligations. I believe it was the language, and the 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 uh, lawsuit is is because the legislature and and we're not picking on Republicans. That just happens to be who is in control of the state of Florida. But the the they they the uh, the all terms is actually in the article rather than all obligations. All terms uh, uh, they they defined that language to mean any. Any civil levies, you know, any restitution beyond just serving your probation and parole. Now, we don't know what, the, when people say, well, what's the court going to decide? We don't know. What did the voter visualize in Florida? What were they led to believe that we were voting for? Were they voting that you could have your right restored when you had paid every bit of restitution and case related cost? Or were they voting to make you whole once you had served your prison time in any post-prison supervision? What did that amendment mean to the average voter? Because the language says all terms. What does all terms mean? How would you even, that seems like post, how would you even determine, you could find that information out 
prior to, but then all the waters would be muddied at this point. You couldn't go back and ask. I don't think, I don't think you could get uh, honest answers because with all the reporting that would have been done up to this point, people would have their opinions altered pro or, you know, pro or against just in light of all the, the hoopla about it. Well, this is going to come down to a judicial interp- interpretation, and we're going to have the the Scalia model, which is going to go to straight to the letter of the, what does the word mean? What do all terms mean? Scalia would say, well, the lawmakers are very smart people, and they said all terms. And I look at your JNS, your judgment sentence, and one of the terms of your sentence was that you pay restitution. So to me, it's cut and dry. It's black and white. If I'm a Scalia, uh, uh, that, that if you go strictly by the text, if you're a textualist, if you if you go to that craziness that people that b- believe that purpose is is what you should look at, if you look at what we, what does Scalia call that purposivism, if you look at mm-hmm. if you look at that, well. What did the voters think they were voting on? I have no idea. I wasn't in Florida. Uh, there, I'm sure there was a lot of advertising, a lot of promotion you know, to vote in favor of Amendment 4. I don't know what the debate was on the floor of the Senate and the House when they were pass, passing this and sending it on to the voters, because I'm imagining it, it like if it's similar to our state, the amendment has to get past the legislature and then it's presented to the voters. The, it, it doesn't have to be signed by the governor. Uh, but I'm assuming that it's very similar. Well, what did the voters intend to do if you're a purposivist? And I just don't know how this is going to play out because all terms, if you take it literally, that was a term, wasn't it? Yes. All right. Well, have you paid your fine, Andy? That would, I would think that that would be one of the terms of your sentence. Okay. Well, then. Then why are we even having this discussion when I look at your list of terms and you had to pay a thousand dollars in restitution, you had to pay a victim impact fee, you had to do this and that, and I see a whole bunch of terms. You served your time, you did that, but I see some terms that are incomplete. So I don't know what we're having this discussion for. Could it be that you have unpaid parking tickets and and maybe that doesn't uh, cross the threshold? But could you you could have fines from other felonies that you've already served your time and all that stuff. And then this one is still that, that those things from 10, 20, 30 years ago are holding you up from being able to vote now. That's correct. If you have if you have any outstanding terms that are unsatisfied under this amendment four, the way I understand it, you're not going to be able to vote until the the legislature said that all terms, in our opinion, means this. Now, if the people are so righteously indignant about that because it passed it passed the, the, the citizenry by a significant margin, the people don't have to accept this this interpretation by their legislature. They could register complete resentment at them at the polls this, this November, couldn't they? I would think so, and they could hire a whole new staff of, of legislators to put forth that says, hey, if you've done your prison term or your, your supervision term, then you can then go vote, be damned the monies. Well, that's what we're going to do. What's going to come out of this case, and 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 there's a lot of states looking at it, according to the article. Very well, sir. Very well. Then we should move over to an article from Reason Magazine. It says, "Condemned to death by a split jury in Florida." We just talked about something about this, and I thought that uh, um, death sentences were all unanimous, and this confused me in them talking about not unanimous sentences in other states. That's why I put it in here. I knew exactly that this is where this is going to go. Because the guilt or innocence has to be determined unanimously. And then you proceed in a capital case to, to the sentencing phase. And in some of these particular southern states, not just southern, but particular southern states, they allow the, the jury to make a recommendation that the judge is likely to follow. In some cases, they actually allow the jury to impose it. But in Florida, if if the jury is in terms of the guilt has already been decided that they committed the, the act, then if if ten of twelve agree that the death penalty is appropriate, that's what's imposed. So you you get a you get a punishment that's you not non unanimous, but but the, the guilt or innocence is unanimous. 
unlike in Louis, unlike in Louisiana and Oregon, where the where the, 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 the verdict itself was non unanimous in terms of your guilt or innocence. Can I, to to word it in my own stupid terms, so you could be found guilty by less than a unanimous jury, but then the court imposes a death sentence on you. No, the the decision on your guilt of innocence, guilt or innocence, has to be unanimous in Florida. All right. But then we proceed to punishment. Okay. The jury decides what do we want life in prison or do we want the death penalty? And if ten of the twelve jurors agree that the death penalty is appropriate, that's enough on the punishment. But all of them had to agree that you were guilty of the of the of the murder. Oh, so the jury gets to make two decisions about yes. innocence or guilt, and then what level punishment. of punishment? Yes, and in some oh. states the jury recommends it, in some states they actually impose it. In Florida, apparently, the jury is the sentencing uh, on these cases. Like in Arkansas, the jury recommends, and the judge often, almost always, follows that recommendation. But, but this is only on the puni- this is only on the punishment phase. So you you go to death row without a unanimous decision of the jury, as long as ten or twelve agree. Oh, okay. The, again, back to my my stupid brain, my uninformed brain. Like innocence or guilt is l- lesser than sentencing someone to death. It would seem that we would have a higher bar for that level of uh, finality. It would seem. Uh, but you're, you're confusing the issue. The jury has to be unanimous on whether sure. or not you, you committed the act. Right. So yeah, the, yeah, state no, has to, get that. the state has to prove out beyond reasonable doubt that you're a murderer. But, but so, then they could be uh, t- t- 10 of the 12 could say, yes, nuke them, and that's enough to get nuked. That's bizarre to me. So, well, that's what Florida decided to do after the Supreme Court dec- declared their death penalty unconstitutional. So they came back and, and they, they fixed it. Wow. Uh, hey, go Florida. They did something right finally? Well, I don't know if they did it right. Depends on if you, if you believe in non-unanimous verdicts. I would prefer if someone's going to get the death penalty. I'd prefer there not be a death penalty, but I'd prefer that everybody agree. I would, but, uh, yeah. That's that's sort of where I was going with that. That uh, like for for that level of finality to to make sure that everybody's on board with that idea that that should be, that's 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 a heavy burden. That's a heavy toll to to impose on someone. So, uh, but yes, so uh, that's that's what happens. Huh. Well, th- we should uh, we should we should take up this article. It comes from Patch dot com, which is always our favorite uh, publication source. During the uh, during the Halloween season, because they're the ones that are posting all the articles, the hate articles about registrants and uh, I'm sorry, PFRs, people forced to register around the Halloween holiday, which isn't a holiday. But this is a modified sex offender registration system. At at first blush, this seems like one of the things that we've been asking for. This is an automated way because of COVID that people can't go in to do the registration. That this might be an avenue for you to do your registration without being physically present. That you could do update your uh, your residence, maybe update a photo, and so forth. Did you read it the same way? I did, but but what's going to happen is it's going to have a monetary component attached to it, as everything does. All this great technology comes with money attached to it, and. For the convenience of being able to go to the kiosk, you're going to have to pay. Just about bet you. Oh, what do you so bet? we get a conven- we get a convenience checkout fee. Yes, I'm 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 figuring that all this all this is driven. This is the your great capitalist system figuring out a new way to extract money. And They've been in business got- since the early 2000s. I went and looked up like their about page, and their whole purpose is to monetize the registry system. Well, absolutely. They monetized it. The government's paid them gobs of money for what they're already doing. They, uh, I, if for, uh, do, you, do you happen to know how many states use Offender Watch as the, uh, like the online reporting, like to go look up somebody's address in your neighborhood? Do you happen I to think know how it, many states? I think it's more than the majority. I don't know. I think really? the last okay. heard of over, th- over 30. It's yours. It's not mine. So. Uh, Anyway, so this would allow you to, I think, put something of an app on your phone to do your update, which then you think might come with, hey, if you want to do your update here, you could do it, pay us twenty nine ninety five to update your, your status instead of going into visit the Popo? That's what I'm predicting. I, I base that on, on vehicle registration. All the things that our 
state does what we call the motor vehicle division. Most people call it the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, but we don't have a department. We have a division, which is a part of Taxation and Revenue Department. And the motor vehicle division is privatized. We have both state-operated MVD and we have private MVD Express. And if you want the convenience of being able to go and be treated with dignity and respect and not have to wait in line and deal with those awful government bureaucrats, you can pay a transaction fee. And I think last time I tried, it was around $16 to do, in addition to the, you know, to the, so if your license is going to cost you $16, for example, you'd pay the sixteen ninety five dollars uh, fee to the, to the private provider. Now, I found it to be, last time I went in, I was going to renew my driver's license at, at MVD Express for the very reasons I just said. And I went in. And they told me that I did not qualify with my vision. Well, I just had had a visual exam, and I just had a brand new pair of glasses. And they told me at MVD Express that I did not qualify because I was not able to read from both eyes, but you're not required to. And I told them, you cannot show me anywhere in the motor vehicle code that you're required to have binocular vision. You're not even required that to have that to have a pilot's license much less to drive a motor vehicle. And I said, I've been licensed for all these decades. And you people are telling me that I have to have binocular vehicle. That's right. I said, show it to me in the code. Well, nobody could show it to me in the code. So I finally left and I went to the state operated office and I got my number and I said, before I sit and wait, do you people understand whether or not I have to have binocular vision to get renewed by license? They said, yes, we do. And I said, so you understand that if I only have one-eyed vision, you can actually issue me a license before I sit here and wait. And they said, yes, of course. And I said, okay. So I waited. So sometimes the private company doesn't know best, but anyway. (laughs) After we've taken that little detour, uh, I'm trying to, if if you have a job where your employer is not flexible, maybe they have a tight schedule of some sort, maybe you're a truck driver of some sort, you're on the road, maybe traveling, whatever. This could be, you know, a saving element for you and as a convenience fee maybe it's a you know maybe it's a twenty dollar fee like you described sixteen seventeen bucks that but that could be a huge burden for someone now they have to take a day off from work and now potentially miss that whole days of pay that would be a pain in the ass. Well that's what that's where I brought the point up. If 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 I'm guessing right this is going to turn into something where they will agree offender watch will provide the kiosk so the state doesn't have to invest any money and all we ask is that we just be compensated for our technology which is a transactional fee and the people can decide they can go to the sheriff's office and they can wait in line and they can sit and get COVID-19 and they can be fingerprinted or they can come use this nice thing and put their finger on the screen and it'll read their fr- their thumb or their fingerprint and we can have them out in a, in a blast and there's no reason why they shouldn't pay. That's where I think this is potentially going to head. I'm with you. Wow. And people and people will pay. Um, I can see it. If, if Instead of going and being manhandled, if I can just talk to a computer, Larry, I would pick talk to a computer over being manhandled any day of the week. And how much would you pay for that service? Because we know law enforcement is listening, so we can get some idea of what to put the fee at. What would you be willing to pay to $7. go talk to the ninety-five cents. That's it. So if it, so if it's eight ninety-five, <laughs> you won't you won't pay it. I would uh, probably. I don't, I don't. If it were it's less than twenty, I would most likely just just do that but more than i would have to start having a question with a conversation with myself about it and i would say self let me ask you a question so and uh but if it were like 50 now nah, i'd probably go get manhandled but that also has a lot to do with that my uh process here has been super stress-free in my opinion like the individual that does it is you know i, I don't know if the bedside manner is the right term but he is professional he is not you know, he's not like a drill sergeant telling you to get down on the floor and do push-ups all the time. He's 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 a cordial individual, and I I don't I don't have a stressful situation when I do it beyond the stress of having the day to go do it. Well, you're fortunate. There's there's I so know. many there's so many that that have very stressful encounters, and they are told to do things that the law doesn't require. Right. And in fact, we were looking at your. Uh, uh, county just north of Atlanta, northwest Cobb County, that where they're inventing a lot of requirements. And being sued on behalf of such things, right? Well, we're working on that. We're trying to put together the right 
claims and cause of action. I, I really don't like losing litigation. I have this thing about you. You, you, <laughs> you have to, you have to select carefully. And you have to make sure you have solid case law on your side, and, uh, and you, you, you pick the right plaintiffs, and you go into it with the intent of winning. And of course, you can't win them all, and and no one wins them all. But except for the state. They do win most all of them when, when they prosecute people. But but when you're doing civil rights litigation, you're not going to win them all. But you need to you need to win the majority of them. You can't stay in business because it's very expensive. And your donors won't support you if you continually lose litigation. That might not always be true, Larry. I'm not going to go into who I might be referring to, but that might not always be true. <laughs> all righty, then. Over at MyNewsLA.com, buyers of $1 million Glendale homes say they weren't sex... Wait, there's a missing word in this title. They weren't informed of a sex offender living next door. Um, So here's this Glendale couple suing because they bought a million dollar home that had quote unquote substantial defects and also that a RSO, PFR, lived next door. I have spoken at length with a a friend of mine that's a realtor and that person is not required to divulge anything about crime statistics in the neighborhood about any of the professions of people living nearby and especially nothing about any pfrs living next door or within a thousand feet or in the state it's not on the list it would introduce personal biases it would introduce uh you know their opinion into your decision to buy a house. Leave it. It's, it's on you to go do those uh, due diligence things and finding out what the crime rate is in your neighborhood and whatnot. I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I suspect this claim is not going to go all that far. If the uh, if, if you've got an online registry, and I think California's is, uh, I think all all the people except maybe a juvenile uh, are on the public registry. If you if you're going to buy a home and that's a factor for you, it would be like any other research as you described, the crime statistics, the schools. Now, most most realtors will list the schools, you know, the the, 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 the attendance boundaries. They'll tell you where, what your designated school would be. But but if you but want to know if there's an a, opinion. But if that's you want to know if there's a, well, wouldn't the PFR be a fact also? Uh, yeah, I suppose. I suppose. Uh, but but I think that if we have a public registry, it would be behoove you if that's a factor for you to 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 do that research to figure that out. And uh, well, now what will happen is that the lawsuit will probably get tossed. Then the person will go to a lawmaker in the assembly in California and say, "Pass a bill that requires this," and everybody will be put in a position where they can't vote against it. Because how can you vote against this disclosure? I put my whole life savings into this and come to find out. Look what was next door. They bought a million dollar home, man. I don't think that that's their life savings. If they got that high to get a home. Somebody's making some pretty decent cash at that point. So, but, but yeah. But it's, how, do you think that because California, I, I don't want to use the term nanny state, but more of a nanny state, they may have this on their books? Well, it didn't say that in the article. It didn't say that there was a a, a requirement to disclose that. Yeah, I was just well, I was just wondering if possibly. I mean, this could be something a blindside that me being over in Redville that that's being Blueville that maybe they have a little bit more of a nanny situation and the realtors are required to go do it. Well, but, if they if they're not, they're going to soon have that uh, uh, introduced in the California Assembly. Well, then pontificate for me, Mr. Uh, Lobbyist person, that how would a realtor protect themselves in that situation that they did a search a week before closing and then a PFR moves in, like they're supposed to continually update, update until the second that they're signing the the piece of paper. Like like they close the documents like uh, two or three days before. So like you have to have everything updated prior to that or else now the realtor and the realtor company is liable for it. Well, I think you would do it kind of like you do when you when you cite to a to a a website when you're doing a briefing. You you put last visited on the uh on, we we'll, we we'll put the link and then we put last visited because stories get updated. And I think you would you would uh, say that uh, on your disclosure mm-hmm. that that a search had been done on the California Sex Offender Registration website, and as of this date, there was nobody within this radius. I think is what you would do. 
and then but there's no guarantee that there won't be anybody with that radius very shortly thereafter yeah because there's even a delay in the reporting side of it that you know new person comes out of prison and goes to move them with mom and mom and them and all of you know how long does it take before the website gets updated maybe it's a week maybe it's 48 hours maybe it's two weeks and in that window you did your checks and and now you you've got that gap that window seems almost impossible to actually keep up with it, it would be it would be something where i would not be in favor of it, but if, if such a piece of legislation is introduced it's going to be hard to vote against it hmm. so you have to kill it in committee are we back to that that's where we are. If it makes it out of committee, it's going to be hard to kill this thing on the on the floor. Uh, can you imagine the vilification point- you would take for voting against alerting families that there was a PFR in their neighborhood? Very much so. Very much so. All right. Well, I found a video from. Uh, we've covered the individual. God, I think we covered a video like a year ago, and it's just this dude that like moved to Germany, and he periodically puts out videos uh he seems to be doing it a little bit more and one showed up uh data today about language levels and certifications and by all means please go watch it it's, it's just shy of 20 minutes long i find the individual super interesting and the idea of just moving away from all this registry bullshit like just hey look it happened long enough ago that perhaps they don't care if that narrative is true i don't know how to validate that other than hearing his testimonial but I have a little clip, and after uh, you give me your, your feedback, initial thoughts on it, I will play it. And I just have about a minute or so clip of something he says at the end that doesn't just apply to this, but applies to anything that we are going to talk about trying to make life better for people. But before I play that, do you have any initial thoughts? Well, you remember when we played him the last time, I said that that his experience with the German police, I would not be ready to say that that's what every foreign national would encounter with the German uh, immigration customs or yes. they call their equivalent. So I would uh, say the same thing again, that this individual may not be representative of what the nation. Uh, yeah, your mileage may vary. Yes, you uh, and past performance may uh, uh, may not indicate future results. <laughs> so, that sounds like a stock tip. That's what they say, yep. All right, so I got this little clip. It's a little over a minute long to play. I tell you all the time, in every video that I have, I always make it a point to say, if you're not happy with your life, if you're not happy with your situation, do something about it. And I mean it, but it's on you to do it. Nobody's going to do it for you. If you just wait for your circumstances to change, you're going to be waiting an awfully long time. So people ask me often, What's the first thing I should do? What's the first step I should take if I'm thinking about moving to Europe? This is the first step you should take. You should start thinking about where would I like to live in Europe? Where do I think I'd fit in? Let's say that it's France. At that point, what you need to do is you need to start learning French, but you need to start learning it like you mean it. And let's say you have a year left on your probation. Let's say you have two years left of parole. You spend that time devoted to getting the basics of your language. Now, granted, you're going to learn that language much, much better once you're in country. But this is a concrete step that you can take today. This is something that you can begin today. And you can start taking back control of your life. Because I understand that your freedom, your physical freedom, is restricted by the the sex offender registry or parole officer or your conditions of probation. I understand that, but nobody's going to stop you from studying a language. And this is something that you can do now. So stop being a victim of your circumstances and start being a survivor. Start looking for solutions to your problems. This is a distinct step forward that you can do right now. And I highly encourage you to do it if you are considering moving to Europe. The, my main emphasis behind this is you could transpose out of there anything about language and move into Germany. But if you want to change your situation, it is on you to go figure out things that you can do to improve your situation. And, and while I know that it's crushing all that comes down the pike with the registry, there are things that you, me, we can do to make things better for our own personal lives and things that we can make better for us as a community of PFR's lives. I figured that was why you zeroed in on that segment, and I agree that yep. that 
what we what we sit back and there's a there's a, a an apathy of wanting to be saved. This is so wrong that someone should save me, and the someone is you. Right. The someone is you. Each and every one of you that are listening, and friends that you know that are in a similar circumstance. It's you that will convince the lawmakers. One by one, we can educate people and sway them that everybody is not the monster that they think, because most lawmakers don't even know the breadth of the registry. It's never been, it's it's something that's out of sight and out of mind. They don't think about the registry. They know that as far as they're concerned, that people on it are really bad. And the only way to dispel that rumor is for you to go meet with a lawmaker. And if you have the ability to say, I am on the registry, and I'm on the registry for this. And what, watch their eyes glaze over when you tell them that what you did, that was relatively, many of the people are on the registry for relatively minor incidents, like the, the, the consensual sex with an underage partner. You say, well, I was 19 and she was 17, and anything under 18 in this state is a felony, and I'm on the registry for that. Uh, but we were both in love. They go, huh? You're on the registry for that? Yep, I'm on the registry as a child sex, a violent child sex offender, and I'm on for life. Right. Those are stories that they need to hear. And you've also said that the stories from probably more so like on the young children that says, I miss my dad, would have a lot of impact as well. They would. The, the, the adolescent stories in particular, because when you're, when you're in single digits, the, the understanding of a, of a child 10, less than 10 years old is probably minimal. but once they move past that age and they start understanding more and relating to, to, the, to the circumstance their family is in, you can only hide this from your children for so long. And, and then at some point, they want to know what, what this means, and you have to explain it to them and the things that they're not allowed to do because of their, of their parent being on the, on the registry. You have to deal with that. And then those stories will be compelling coming from an adolescent that, I would like to be able to do these things, but I'm not allowed to. Yep. I'd like to have I'd like to have my parents both at my school play, but I'm not. They're not allowed to be there. There's another uh, another particular piece. I think it was in the clip that I played about learning something that they cannot take away. And I've held this philosophy for my entire professional career that instead of having an employer pay for your training, if it's something you can afford, if you can go buy a series of books and train yourself. They can't ever take that away, and it puts you in a negotiation position where you can say, well, I know this thing, and you're not willing to pay for it. I'm not obligated to you because I learned it on my own. Then I can go take my uh, skills elsewhere and get compensated for it, whether that be a bachelor's, master's, certifications, truck driver, forklift driver, fill in however you want to uh, you know, improve your skill set. Then they can't take it away from you. I agree that. When, when people say what, the, what they're not allowed to do, there are a lot of things that they're allowed to do that they self-impose that they're not allowed to do. You do have some limitations on attending a structural university or college yeah. or uh, educational setting. But there are a lot of things where there would be no such barrier if you're doing it on self-study or online. And I I I like to go back to Apollo 13. I don't want to hear about the, what this thing was designed to do. I want to hear what it can do. <laughs> yeah, and absolutely. and I want to hear, I want to hear people talk about what they can do, what options they have available to them. And not not that I mean yes we 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 understand there are a lot of barriers, but let's let's focus on what what we can do rather than what we're prohibited from doing. Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747-227-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registrymatters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. 
We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. Let's bounce over to the Washington Post. No one should profit off of prisoners trying to stay in touch with their families. I personally know that this is horrible that how much they charge for phone calls, uh, which has got to be why you would find so many contraband cell phones in prison. But they'll you would possibly end up spending 20 or something dollars to make a 15 minute phone call. I always come back to, I really, really thought that the idea of prison was rehabilitation, but a key component of rehabilitation would be contact with those friends, family, whomever. And there are so many barriers where you have to get uh, approval for who's on your call list before you can make those phone calls. And they, they do minor background checks on those people. And then they hit you with this huge fee of keeping in touch. It's so, so challenging to then uh, ask someone to say, hey, I'd like to call you once a month. Can you accept a $15, $20 phone call from me? And they're like, no, no, you're not worth all that. Well, I think we've talked about this. This is in the federal, in the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Relief, whatever that acronym stands for. But the, 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 the feds are not charging for phone calls, as I understand it now. Of course, if you're locked down, that limits your ability. But, but this is provoking some debate about, about the uh, unreasonable charges for telephones. But I go back to what I've said before. It is a revenue stream for our prisons. And I'll give you an example of, that's a much, much different example. But since I'm in a state where, where the uh, income tax, the state income tax piggybacks federal, you can end up paying tax on your Social Security benefits. And we're only, what, nine or ten states that, that do that. And people say, well, why don't you take it off? Well, there's a revenue component that goes with that tax. Uh, we are collecting some money that funds part of the state operations from that tax. And then they'll come back and they'll say, well, if we make New Mexico a retirement haven, more people will come and we'll get all that tax revenue. But see, there's one slight flaw with that argument. If all the states are doing it except for nine or ten already, people are, people are already set in their older age and they may not come. But even if they do come, if that gush comes, that's off into the future. I have to balance this budget now. So if I pull out $33 billion or whatever that brings in of tax revenue, that is something that I have to replace now. Because making the cuts is difficult. Nobody wants to be cut. Now, we're going to be cut because of this pandemic where states are going to be doing some significant cutting. But the same thing goes with the prison if, or, or county jail, which county jails tend to charge more. But this is a revenue stream for the institution. And it's difficult to take away a revenue stream and go back to the taxpayers and say, well, <laughs> the, the, the phone contract at MDC, which is our local county jail, brought in $2.2 million. We're turning that thing off now. Okay, well, now of our, of our $350 million county budget, where are we going to plug that two million of revenue back from to take up for the phone site? What 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 are we going to cut or what are we going to increase? What are we going to do for that for that money? Couldn't we just lock up fewer people? Well, we could do that, but that still wouldn't address the issue of the free phone calls. That would there would still be a revenue stream there that would be going away. If you if you cut the population in jail from twenty five hundred to fifteen hundred, clearly there would likely be fewer phone calls, but it's still a revenue stream, right? Yes, it is. Well, I, there, I, there I seem to problem. change my position while I was gone about I, because you've committed a crime against the state and it is in the state's interest that you not commit those in the, in the future, that the state should bear the burden of rehabilitating you and all that. The whole private prison thing and all the private services stuff, sh there shouldn't be this massive markup on it. If a, if a private company is going to be provided, it's almost make it like a, a Georgia Power thing where it's a private-public partnership, and they are regulated at to what they can charge. They have to get uh, the legislative approval before they do rate hikes and whatnot. And there's some sort of balance set in there to keep prices as low, but then the company can still make money. And... I don't think that this is in there, Larry. This is totally, hey, well, these pers these people, no one gives a shit about, and we can gouge them, and they're a forgotten 
uh, group in society. So let's let's just gouge them. They deserve it. Well, it, it's it's that, but it's the apathy of the population. The the go out and campaign. Try to try to try to sell this politically. That we want to turn off all the revenue streams that come from prisoners, and we want to divert a lot more money out of the general fund to rehabilitative programs, to counseling, and to reintegration. And tell me how that sells for you. You're in a good county. Go out and do that and tell me how that works. I'm sure it wouldn't work. But, you know, like you could easily say, just like with people that uh, when they fall down on their luck and they lose their job, well, I don't have any money in savings. Well, you should have thought about before blah, blah, blah. Well, the state should have thought about that before a global pandemic kicks in and we implement procedures and, and things so that people can stay in touch because we've also shut off visitation. Like they should have thought about this beforehand to have a, a buffer in their coffers. Well, I mean, I agree with you that I know. that we should not be gouging people for telephone, but I'm I'm giving you the political reality that you've got you've got a, a you've got revenue that flows. And one thing that most Americans almost unanimously agree on is that people who are being kept up by the taxpayers should be contributing all they can. And this is one way where they give back as they pay for the privilege of talking on a telephone and for using the internet for, for the, they're doing these uh, video visitations. Now they're charging for those. And, and uh, that that's, I, we've got to change the mindset of the, of the public in terms of what they want and their corrections right now. I don't see us making a massive lurch towards, I mean, if you look at how, how timid we're being on releasing people, that should tell you that we have not all of a sudden had an epiphany about being soft on people who are incarcerated. Right. If you can't get people out of, out of, uh, out of death's way, they're, they're in these institutions that are so grossly overcrowded, they have no way of providing any buffer for them whatsoever. I don't like it, Larry. Do not like it. Well, I got an What's idea. Well, I got an idea. Rather that? than going, rather than going out and going to some of your groups on Sunday, go out and spend each Sunday trying to educate. Spend your time at the Macon Mall or whatever it's 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 still where there's still people, and talk <laughs> about and, and try to not there and and try to inform people about the misguided nature of our correctional system in the United States and 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 and, and win them over one at a time. I, I will start working on that for sure. And I will wear something of a bomb suit because I'm sure people are going to throw things at me. <laughs> we, have right. a, 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 we have a trio of articles talking about this particular one. It's, uh, and this particular one is from CNS News. It says, California DA calls out court for using COVID-19 to justify releasing seven convicted high-risk sex offenders. I wanted to get an audio clip that someone shared and uh, had trouble actually getting the little bit of a clip. But even if you take just the little clip of the DA saying it, and, and I'm, I tried really hard to figure out how I could say I've taken it uh, to take it out of context, and I don't want to, but he said, sex offenders uh, cannot be rehabilitated and they need to be monitored. And I don't know if he said for life after that, but he said, uh, they, oh, oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's even a quote in this particular article that says, yeah, I did call out the court for releasing seven convicted high risk sex offenders who are failing to report for parole. Oh, never. Um, does it say it? Does it say it? Does it say it? Uh, no, it doesn't have a quote in the article then it does, where he said it. But he said they can't be. Um, they can't be uh, rehabilitated. Well, he he he's better than that. He he says uh, now the district Orange County District Attorney is named uh, Todd Spitzer, and and he was on Fox and Friends. Now, does that tell you anything? That he's on a, a that's a national sh- show, so he's applying nationwide pressure to judges in Orange County that have re- released some offenders for their safety but but he uh, but he says that that they that they were charged with cutting off their GPS monitors and otherwise tampering and that in all likelihood they probably weren't cutting uh, they lo- they lost signal that you know the the the, the GPS loses Fair contact yeah, yeah, yeah. and and uh, and I'm not saying that no one cut them but I'm sure that very few people have cut their uh, the, 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 those but he he's lambasting the judge. He's getting public opinion all excited. These people shouldn't be released to the street. They should be locked up in our jail, he told Fox and Friends. 
and 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 he says that they can't be rehabilitated. And this is what I was just describing previously. This is this is where the public is. He's saying this because the public they're 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 loving this. <laughs> who who do you think has better public support right now? The judge who let these people out in a compassionate way, or or Spitzer? Who do you th- or if you took a poll to Orange County, who do you think would be ahead? Uh, I would be willing to bet he is. So that is that is the whole point. And here is the quote: it "says I'm here to tell you, sex offenders cannot be rehabilitated, and when they're trying to avoid detection, like they are here in Orange County, they need to be locked up, and we need to protect the public." And if you see yeah. the picture, for, for, forgive the seven individuals' pictures. They are very scraggly-looking individuals that you would probably be afraid of to encounter on the street. So, well, and then toward the end of the article, he says, "What's happening, though? It, though is that I think it's been a ruse on the American public about freeing our jails, and there's actually been an advancement of a social policy to not incarcerate." So and, and that's. Throw all the tomatoes at me. Do you think there has any uh, coincidence there that he's on Fox News saying that? Uh, don't don't think there's any coincidence at all. Mm-mm-mm-mm. All right. So before I get angry about that particular one, over at the appeal, well, I'll get angry about this one. Tennessee set to execute intellectually disabled black men in killing of white women, even though innocence questions persist. This happened a long time ago, and the person. His girlfriend lived across the hall and he apparently like was going over to her house and found the door open, goes in to attempt to help and to see what was up. Maybe he heard a, a scuffle or something like that, heard some, some crying maybe and goes in to help, ends up with like blood on his hands and all stuff. And then they uh, prosecuted him and got convicted and there's a uh, execution coming halfway soon. But there's a lot of questions about how the case was developed and the guilty verdict and all this stuff. These things are terrible, Larry. So, yeah, well, the the part that that puzzled me a little bit is, uh, I guess, the pulling the knife out. If a person's dead, there's no need to. But if they're not dead, uh, I've always heard that you could do more damage. But if you're intellectually challenged, I guess I would explain why you wouldn't why you wouldn't necessarily comprehend that. But but pulling the knife out uh, was what he did that got the blood on him. And his version of the events. Yep. Would well, I mean, you've you've stumbled in situations like this with knives and people before. What is your reaction? Oh, do you course. leave the knife? Yes, I, all the time, leave, almost, you, almost daily, Larry. <laughs> do you are do you, are, 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 are have you removed the knife when you've run into this in the past? This is one of the things in in the quote unquote treatment programs that they provide that if you are encountering a single child and they are crying for help, you should probably go the other way lest someone accuse you of doing something that you did not do. I find that to be incredibly inhumane. But were I to come up on someone that had a knife in them, I would certainly not pull it out. <laughs> but I do know that already because you the the art the knife could be blocking the artery from them bleeding out. But if you are intellectually disabled, I don't think the article said is he 10 points below average is he 50 points below average doesn't say how uh, in, uh, debilitated disabled he is that uh, I, and not that I have any level of expertise to make that decision but maybe the person just doesn't know there are all kinds of people that don't know all kinds of quote unquote common sense things too absolutely and and, uh, and uh, executing a person in this pandemic makes it very difficult with the distancing orders to have the people there to witness that there's a process an execution is a complicated thing yeah, uh, and I learned that when when uh, when when we uh, uh, we had our last execution. I'm trying to remember what year it was. A long, long time ago, a very long time ago, we had in this state the last execution. I think it was maybe about 2000, so at least 20 years ago, uh, maybe even a little bit before 2000, but somewhere in that range. And those who want to bring the death penalty back, they they said that that. That they they admitted that they would have to go be trained on how to do an execution, to go through all the the processes of of of, of gearing up, preparing the inmate, preparing the families, preparing the witnesses, and 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 it's it, you you can't do all that in the middle of this pandemic because you don't you don't want you don't want those people together in the execution room and the visitation room, uh, you know, the viewing room. Yes, I understand. So 
So, so do you think that this gains any traction? I don't think our Supreme Court does a whole lot with these kinds of cases very often. If he's down to 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 nothing but the federal court, he's his his chances are very slim. He's going to need something to happen within the state of Tennessee, but the U.S. Supreme Court has taken a hands-off posture largely on most executions. The 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 uh, the Supreme Court justice that's, a ty- that's assigned to that circuit has the power to issue a stay, but the experience is that the full court convenes and dissolves the stay, so they're pointless to issue stays any- anymore. So 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 that's one of those things where you call the 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 circuit judge. That, that presides over that circuit, uh, they say it's not going to do any good. If I give you a stay, they're going to dissolve it within a few days. Gotcha. Uh, then we have an article from The Hill. Welcome back to COVID articles. 96% of inmates in four state prisons who tested positive for coronavirus were asymptomatic. So what does asymptomatic mean, Larry? Well, it means it means that they weren't displaying any of the expected symptoms that that we've been told to look out for but i'm not so sure about that that number because if they're going to isolate you put you in the hole and that's prison jargon for not a nice place to be they're going to put you in seg i would suspect a lot of people that that have symptoms or doing everything they can to to hide those disguise those symptoms wouldn't you Yes, totally. Because yeah, you you would you would be miserable. It is miserable in isolation. So I'm I'm a little dubious about the numbers. You don't think the ninety six is accurate? It's hard for me to believe that 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 it, that, that would be realistic. That uh, that uh, that ninety six of them were also, asymptomatic. That would also imply that they all got tested. Uh, but if if that's the case, then we've got an awful lot of people that are that are running around that are positive out in the population. I would agree with that too, and, and I mean that's one of the big challenges in the United States is we haven't had anywhere near enough tests uh, compared to I, I think uh, I think South Korea is reporting single digit numbers of new cases, and we've detected it in country as far as I know, unless the information has changed. Both both us and South Korea detected it in country on the same day. And they're down to single digits across their country of, I think, 100 million people in South Korea. Maybe it's 80 million people in South Korea. So I, I, I realize it's not geographically similar and population, it's not terribly similar. It's kind of sort of similar. But they, uh, they have enough tests and a different uh, government structure that they can implement testing better or something like that. Anyway, we don't have enough tests. So I don't know how they would get 96% of the prisoners to be tested. That's a puzzle because most of the, uh, what I'm hearing at the institutions is that no one can get a test. Very difficult um, to get a test. Um, yeah, and but if you're if you're in a room with eighty people and one person has it, you could probably just. I don't think it would be very much of a leap, Larry, to go. They all have it in that dorm. I don't think that would be that much of a stretch. Very likely. Thoughts? Very likely. Um, let's see, where do we have to go next? That was the Hill, then WBUR in Boston. We have an article that says Mas- Ma- Massachusetts, I think you call it Taxachusetts, High Court urges governor to use his powers to release prisoners because of COVID-19? Why yeah, would the, we release people based on COVID-19? The reason why I put this in here is because the court the court stood down and said we're not, we're not uh, going to usurp the power. The executive has an enormous amount of power to 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 regulate the pop- population of prison. They have levers and tools at their disposal, and those who believe that they don't want judges legislating from the bench, they should be as happy as a lark with this decision because this is the 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 Supreme Judicial Court, which is the Supreme Court of the state of Massachusetts, saying that we are not going to invent a law. There's already processes. There's already laws on the books to cut down the prison population. Governor Baker, you have those powers. You have those levers. If you if if you want to reduce the prison population, do so. And wouldn't that he make gonna, he's gonna he's gonna hold that account though? They're gonna hold him accountable for that come the next election. Well, we'll see if they do or not. But I mean, that is a, a the decision you would expect and want 
from a court that's not going to be legislating from the bench, which most conservatives decry legislating from the bench. We don't want them legislating from the bench, do we? Well, that's what I'm saying. If you're conservative, you certainly don't. Now, the truth is we do want, everybody wants the judges to legislate from the bench when it's something they're for is they can't get through the regular process. Everybody wants the courts to legislate from the bench. That's why everybody files stuff in court. Yeah. But, but that's the big mantra of the conservatives. We don't want, well, I want the president to appoint people who ain't going to do no legislating from the bench. I want them just to and, interpret the law. And that's what this court did. And that's what Gundy is. That's exactly right. For those of you who don't remember Gandhi, that was a U.S. Supreme Court decision that interpreted the uh, the Attorney General's delegation, the, the Congress de- delegated to the Attorney General, how to how to implement the uh, Adam Walsh Act. Right, 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 right. We're missing a, we're <sighs> missing a, an article in here. We, we, we're we're going to talk about hip- hypocrisy tonight, weren't we? Uh, and which hypocrisy were we going to talk about? Was this we're going about to talk a particular about, vice presidential uh, uh, presidential nomination? Yes, nomination? we're going to talk. We're going to talk about a little bit of hypocrisy. So we need to have you Lester Maddox shared ready. an. Oh, I can get that ready, but you never shared an article. Which one you wanted to talk to me about? While well, I get I, hypocrisy I did, ready, I did send you one on on, on uh, uh, the the normal uh, back channels we use. Uh, describing uh, describing what uh, 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 Kavanaugh had been accused of, and, and then uh, uh, we talked about what Biden's been accused of, and so yeah, I want to. But just in generalities, we don't have to talk about an article. We can just talk about uh, uh, about hypocrisy. See, you tell me that it's not there, but lo and behold, it is now there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the the magic of the internet has made it possible, Larry. So. Tell me, tell me what's up with uh, with uh, comparing Brett Kavanaugh to Joe Biden. Well, I'm struggling with this. Uh, I I remember talking about the governor of New Mexico some few episodes back being accused of sexual misconduct, and she did not resign from office. And I could have sworn we've had uh, who was the senator from Minnesota? Oh, uh, that would be Al Franken. Al, Al Franken, right? Uh, I thought that if an allegation is made that under the standards that the Me Too movement have have universally adopted is that it's the seriousness of the allegations and that to to even dare to question the allegations is to re-victimize the victim who finally, after all these years and sometimes decades, has had the courage to come forward. And I'm just wondering why that Senator, former Senator, former Vice President Biden is able to deflect these allegations and just so cruelly and heartlessly say that they're not true. And he says he doesn't remember it. Now, if something didn't happen, you would have a very difficult time remembering something that didn't happen. So I would, would agree. Tough. I would agree that, that if someone says, I don't remember it, if it didn't happen, of course, you wouldn't remember it. But I'm trying to understand the Me Too standards because it seems like with Kavanaugh, now we had a young man we were talking about in high school and college who was accused of, well, I mean, there's no way to describe it other than rape. And Correct. Then we have a sitting United States senator who was accused in 1993, now he the, the accusation wasn't made official with the police as it wasn't with with uh, uh, Blasey Ford, with Kavanaugh. But so we're we're talking about a person who's much more mature than a high school or a college student. Not that that justifies misbehavior, but we have a sitting United States senator who had at that time chaired the Senate Judiciary Committee, who had overseen the confirmation of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas had heard all of this stuff with Anita Hill and this person if these allegations were true did some pretty gross things to this staffer and I'm just wondering why that it's okay and I don't see the difference because if anything a senator would be held to a higher standard of conduct than a college or a high school 
frat boy, or that's not any fraternities in high school, but a high school kid or a college frat boy. And I'm just I'm just puzzled at the the apologist and the people who now all of a sudden they don't have any issue with with these allegations. And I thought that for what the whole thing was about, the seriousness of the allegation disqualify a person from public life. And believe the woman. That's what I'm trying. And I would like for someone really sincerely to come on the podcast and explain to me what I'm missing, because clearly I'm missing something here. And, and, and the Me Too movement, if any of you are listening, contact the show and we will try to get you on. But I want to know what the difference is. We had the thing with Roy Moore. We're talking about something. Kavanaugh's was in the 80s. Roy Moore's was in the 70s. And we've got a United States senator in the 90s where there's at least as much evidence as there was in those allegations, particularly with, with, with Kavanaugh. The, 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 apparently, there was a call from her mother to the Larry King show saying that a prominent United States senator had done these inappropriate things. And to to, to, to highlight some uh, distinctions, though, so Roy Moore was, as, as I understand the story, he was, I think, in his 30s. He was an ADA, maybe, assistant DA, and a consensual dating relationship with, I think, maybe a 15-year-old. But the family was in on it. They were, like, going out to barbecues and whatnot. But you, you just introduced the, quote-unquote, oogie factor, I guess. Kavanaugh was alleged to have had sex with, I think, a passed-out drunk uh, girl at the time woman now obviously um al franken the only thing that i know that he did there was a picture where he had his hands out like in front of i'm not justifying that it was an okay thing to do but it's it's like he didn't do what kavanaugh was alleged to have done and it still seems to be farther back than what uh biden is being alleged to have done but not to the degree that kavanaugh was and everyone blew off the whole kavanaugh thing not everyone but he obviously got voted in as a Supreme Court nominee, but Franken for doing something as a prank, stupid, inappropriate, fill in all those words, it's fine, but forced out. Well, that's what I'm... I'm I'm with you on the confusion. I'm with you 100%. I want to get this down so I can understand it and explain it to people. Now, Franken was supposedly a liberal. Yes. But here we've got a, a liberal moderate candidate for president and i don't hear a lot from the me too movement and i'm just trying to figure out there's got to be something that i'm missing that makes this different and i need someone to help us with that all right so if you want to hey larry how could they contact the program if they wanted to reach out to us well they would do one of the many many options we have the the best way of course is to call us that way we can play what you say. Uh, that would be 747-227-4477. But if you don't like speaking, you can send us an email to registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You know what I'm going to do, Larry? I'm going to do this impromptu. We received a voicemail just as we started recording. We did. Do you want well, me to play it? We well, did. It, I, I, it, I can play it. It's not going to be edited, and I might have to cut it. Well, let's see what we have. Let's see if I can make this work on the fly. Hi, Andy and Larry. This is Robin, Pennsylvania. Keep up the good work, guys. You're doing a great job. I enjoy listening every week, and I am a supporter, patron. My question is, is in reference to the registries, and you hear it floating around that the numbers are almost up to a million in the country of people in the registries. But my question is, is how accurate is that? Does that include people who aren't actually listed publicly? Like for instance, in New York state level ones are not publicly listed on the website. Does that almost a million, would that include um, those people or is that only based on public, public accessible information? And also, does that take into consideration people that are maybe registered in two different states? Like, for instance, they visited in Florida, so they're on for life and in their own home state. So that's my question. Just wondering how accurate that number is. Thanks, guys. Keep up the great work. Enjoy listening every week. And FYP. 
I think that's an excellent question and well done, Rob in Pennsylvania. I I think it was a great question as well. I do not believe the number is accurate at all. And so the first component of the question about the, the people who are not public, my understanding is is that it only includes the people who are public. Now, that is the overwhelming majority of registrants across the country. country. But he is correct. There are states where there's a segment or slice. It could be juveniles. It could be juveniles only, or it could be juveniles and level ones. And there's a segment and slice of the population that are that are not in that count in my in my experience the other component of it is that that there are dual registrations and there there are people who have deceased and if you simply go to the registry website if that's what the compilers are doing you would have dual registrations a person who's left a state and then they're carried in both states or they're legitimately connected to two states because of the proximity to a border and they're traveling back and forth and they're they're registering in two states and and I believe that there's a lot of duplication of, of that. So I'm not convinced it is a, a, a million, but I'm convinced it's a significant number of, of people, well over well over a half million, and probably closer to just to, to three quarters of a million easily. And then there's some who are who are actually on the list that are incarcerated. They they've they've been in the public and they they've been returned to prison, or in some instances they were put on the public list just because. They were sentenced for a sexual offense. A few states do that. They go ahead and list them upon conviction on the registry, and then they show them the list that they're in a prison in custody. But it's a huge number of people. Hey, Brian in Louisiana says, since NCMEC stopped counting, at least publicly, who knows anymore? That's the National, National Center, Center for, for Missing and Exploited. Missing Children. Exploited. Yes. What did he stopped say? stopped counting? He said they stopped counting, at least publicly. I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. That's the only reason I bring it up. So, well, they they last time I looked, they still have a website that tells how many offenders are on each state's registry as of a certain date. Um, how many uh, people do you think are dual registered, and do places like where they don't uh, publicly register tier ones? Does NCMEC and and others would uh, like uh, Patch and Offender Watch? Would they still have those numbers? I don't believe they do. Um, I believe you'd have to do a, a, a public records request from each state of what their total number of people registered are. And I don't believe they do that, but I can't be absolutely positive. I believe that, that they just simply use the public available information. And and uh, like if you were to, our state doesn't have everyone on the website. It's not a level system. It's at a particular group of offenses that are not listed. And then no, okay. juvenile, no juveniles are listed. But but. It, to, to get the total for New Mexico, you would have to contact the the Department of Public Safety and ask them the total number of people that are registered, and the website would have a lesser number. Uh, but but the dual registrations and the ones who are deceased, that's where the big offsets are because you've got people who started the registry journey in Florida, and they went to another state, and Florida says, we keep your picture and they, we keep your registration information. We show you're living out of state. So that creates a registry, a registry record twice for that person. And then you have people who dutifully go to Florida and they don't want to be in the state more than the what is it, seventy-two hours or whatever it is. So on, the, on those they go register, and then they find themselves listed on both both the Florida uh, and and their home state registry. They find themselves uh, the, the same thing happens in Nevada. So, so there's there's duplications for sure. So it's hard to know what the accurate number is. Um, and I've just added an article to the show notes with a source talking about uh, why did they delete their map of registered SOs in the United States? Uh, no idea the veracity of the article at all, but I am providing you people with a source. And I, and I just misspoke about the, uh, the uh, Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I was thinking of the Class Foundation. They're the ones who had uh, a map of the, of the United States with a with a list of each uh, state's total. And I haven't gone to that foundation website in a long time, but they used to have a total. But it it wasn't uh, it wasn't Center for Missing Exploited Children. Okay. Um, and something else to bring up that uh, Rob in Pennsylvania is a Patreon supporter. Larry, what is the best way to support this podcast? Well, if you're a patron, uh, go. T- immediately log in and double your patron uh, donation 
<laughs> we all know, we know that everyone just got a twelve hundred dollar check, right? Right. Well, why not give us hmm, what? What would be a fair all cut? of it? Uh, all, oh, all. I don't. I was all gonna... of it, including your kid. <laughs> the the five hundred dollar dependent. Uh, as Absolutely, well. all of them. And if you got one for your dog, send that one too. So registrymatters.co. That's where the website is. Patreon.com slash registry matters is the other, the, the place for the Patreon part. Uh, so somebody did a CO. I don't know who did that, but it was uh, me. And I still don't know why. Maybe you were smoking that wacky weed when you did that. That could possibly be true, but hopefully my handlers aren't hearing about that. That way I don't get in trouble for smoking the wacky weed. Um, I would also like to add, Hey, look, we have a YouTube channel. You can, uh, friend us, like us, whatever, subscribe to us there. Help us get our numbers up. We're on Twitter, and I, and I post there at least monthly, at least monthly. Uh, but you could become a, uh, a follower there, and that would also be helpful. You can like and subscribe and write a review for us at all of the places where you, uh, where you subscribe to podcasts. And all those things would be helpful for us to help other people find us. Larry, is there anything else that we need to cover that we've missed that uh, we need to chime in on before you roast and melt? Well, it has uh, continued to climb in here. I think we're about 82 now, but it's, it's, it's uh, not that bad. And no, I, awesome. think we, I think we've had a reasonably short, concise podcast tonight. Yes, and we did record early. Uh, Brian in Louisiana said, hey, and I was all ready for a six uh, central time start, and, uh, and he catches the end. Yes, but that's because it's roasting hot in Larry's uh, recording location. And uh, wanted to get things knocked out before he uh, melts. And I just love my picture. That is just so awesome. I'm glad that you like it. And if you want to find that picture, I don't know if I'm going to publish this to YouTube or not. But otherwise, come check out the live stream. If you want to, there's a link in the show notes and you can uh, come in and, and watch my, uh, my large teeth record the podcast and a picture of Larry at his ripe young age of 300, 250, somewhere around there. <laughs> oh. So, well, all righty, Andy. Have a great night, Larry, and I'll talk to you soon. Good night. Good night. Bye.